Um, as Lou said, I'm Thomas Locke here, and I am manager of Museum of the Everglades, one of the five free uh, Collier County Museums. And we are the, the smallest and the most remote, but we, we like to see ourselves as the mightiest down here. But uh, um, as I'll probably mention a couple times in the course of the, this uh, the talk, uh, Everglades City is the birthplace of Collier County. This is where it all started. So everything around you, it, it started right here. So um, the talk is called uh, Dredge's Dynamite and, and Determination. And it's, let's see, is this moving? Okay, there we go. Um, building of the Tamiami Trail. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna give sort of an overview of the, this whole uh, amazing project. Now, it began with Baron Collier uh, and just kind of a little bit of, of Baron Collier 101 for, the, for the, uh, the people that are not familiar with him or as familiar with him as some of us uh, history buffs are. Born in Memphis, Tennessee, 1873, um, dropped out of high school, started working for the railroad, met a bunch of uh, entrepreneurial type gentlemen while working for the railroad. And one of them that he came in contact with uh, represented a firm that uh, was, was promoting gasoline powered street lamps. And Baron Collier convinced them to let him represent them in the city of Memphis. And then he convinced the city of Memphis to convert all their streetlights over to gasoline powered uh, street lamps and got a tremendous commission. He did not go into the street light uh, business. He instead took that commission and bought a printing plant and went into advertising. Um, he, as it says here, he pioneered streetcar advertising, car cards, those placards that you see in the top of uh, buses or subways and th things like that, cornered the market in Memphis in nothing flat and then made his way to New York. By the time he was 27, he'd made his first million. Um, he was not the sort of businessman that rests on his laurels and decided to look for the next big metropolitan market, which was Chicago. Went to Chicago looking for who owned the streetcars there, found out that, that a, a large percentage of them were owned by a man named John Roach looked for Mr. Roach's office and was told, well, he spends winters in Florida. So 1911, Collier comes to Florida looking for an advertising contract for Chicago streetcars. Uh, Mr. Roach had a grand mansion on Yuseppa Island, owned Yuseppa Island. It was his private spot. By the time Collier left, he, uh, he owned that mansion. He owned half that island and was buying more and more uh, real estate from Mr. Roach. Uh, so this is really the, the beginning for Collier as far as, uh, you know, how the, the, this, this whole uh, Tamiami Trail project would come to be. Uh, he purchases the Everglade town site. At, back then it was called Everglade. He added the S because he felt it uh, rolled off the tongue a little better, which it probably does. He's an advertising guy, so he could make excellent decisions like that. Um, but, um, you know, what did he, what did he see in, in Everglade? Remember at the time there was no road, so he had to come there by boat. And, you know, you're winding your way up uh, the Barren River, uh, which at the time was, was the Allen River. Before that, it was Potato Creek. The naming rights sort of come with the territory here, apparently. Um, but it was like, you know, the, it was this beautiful, exotic American jungle with plants, flora, and fauna. That, that, that were truly, truly exotic, uh, bright colors that, that, that people had never seen. Um, but one of the things that he saw here was that the Storter family, who had uh, you know, really established themselves as the town founder, when we think of Everglades City, we um, invariably think of the Rod and Gun Club. It was built on and around the original Storter uh, family uh, homestead. And um, by the time that Collier got there in, in 1921, the Storter family had figured out that they could make a lot more money as hunting and fishing guides for wealthy Northerners than they could uh, 
you know, farming sugar cane or, or uh, running a, a general store on the river there. And, you know, when I talk about fishing and hunting, you look at that picture there. I mean, Collier looks and they're catching tarpon as tall as he is. And he's a world traveler. He's, a, a, you know, a very, very affluent businessman. And he's thinking about the fact that he would pay for an experience like that. And likewise, while we're, we're dealing with, with species that are all um, rightfully protected at this time, back then, in the early 20s, you're thinking about... Uh, when you know Americans were going on safari in in Africa, and you could do big game hunting right there in Everglades, you could hunt uh, panther, bear, alligator, boar, you know, you name it. You for the for those characters back then that that had a trophy room and were looking to, you know, put animal heads on their walls. This was one-stop shopping. And, and Collier really uh, imagined this as an inter international destination for, for tourism, um, particularly uh, for sportsmen. And, you know, he wasted no time purchasing the, the Storter Homestead, expanding it, renaming it the Rod and Gun Club, adding a nine-hole golf course, um, hiring a, a, a chef who had been the personal chef of General Ludendorff in, in World War One, um, you know, offering unparalleled hospitality. So he's got this this you know destination that he wants to bring people to, and I think that that it's important to realize that that you know he's he's looking at it as a unique, exclusive experience. But there are other factors going on at the same time, and that is that that you know what we call the Florida boom is just starting to take shape. People are interested in buying the property and coming down to visit. And, uh, you know, Collier is, well, here, um, the very first rod and gun club ad that I, I can find dating back to 1923, uh, it suggests you take the, 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 his Deep Lake Company's bus from the First National Bank in Fort Myers. Now you're figuring that the average visitor is coming to Fort Myers probably by train. And so they're taking a train to Fort Myers. He says, get on the bus. The bus will take you to the Naples Pier. At the Naples Pier, you'll uh, get on a, a boat that will take you to Kixambas, which is Marco Island area. And then there you'll get on another other boat and and that will take you to the rod and gun club so you've got a train a bus and two boats just to get to baron collier's resort uh, there was a time when you could sell that sort of adventure but unfortunately for for him this was the moment when the all Americans are starting to reach a point where they can afford their own automobile. Um, in the same way that, that Henry Flagler was a victim of his own success, he popularized Florida and had these grand fancy hotels that, that the majority of the population could not afford to stay in. They started coming down and in, in their own automobiles. So, um, you know, the Roaring Twenties was the time when it when everybody was promoting come to Florida. And coming to Florida was really almost synonymous with driving your car. And, you, you know, you can see that, you know, people would drive to the beach and, and this whole idea of what they called surf bathing and even this postcard saying surf bathing and automobiling at an Atlantic beach in Florida. So, you know, um, I'm going to wait on that one there. Um, so Collier's got the, the, a little bit of a problem here, and that is that, that um, you know, people are looking at it and, the, and the, they're saying, well, we'd love to come to your place, but there's really no road reaching it. And he said, yeah, but, you know, it's great. It's got all these things that, that uh, you know, you, you can't get anywhere else. But in the, instead, he was really losing the, the tourist demographic that he was looking for uh, to other areas, particularly um, to people that, that, that were driving their own cars. And he really um, had to come to terms with the idea that they needed a road to get here. Um, now, Collier explored a lot of different options and, and granted the idea of connecting the coasts was not 
a new one. It wasn't something that that he invented as early as as 1915. Um, forces in in Lee County and and Dade County had been conspiring, you know, talking about doing this, and, and Dade County was much more aggressive in in uh, building, you know, a, a little bit of that of road way making its way across than Lee County ever was, but the, the, the project had really stalled out by, uh, you know, the time that, that, that Collier came in. And so he started, you know, poking around with, with local legislators, people that he knew in the federal government, uh, asking around if, you know, can't we just you know, put this road across here. But the greatest problem that he encountered was there really wasn't a population base, certainly not a tax base in this center portion of South Florida that that really could justify it. Um, so he took another angle. Um, some of you folks may have heard about the trailblazers. And this is, uh, the, uh, you know, what we would today refer to as a publicity stunt in 1923 and it was seven model t's an l car an overland and a truck that drove across the everglades before there was a road proving that it could be done um and you know so the argument of well the, you know you could never build a road there or why would you want to um it looked like a very, very independent project but but remember colliers in the advertising business and he, there were some serious machinations of, of, you know, his influence and probably his financial support at work. Um, you look at the, that, you know, th this gentleman here uh, from a magazine called The Florida Grower, um, Collier was, was, had owned an interest in, in, in that magazine. So um, you, you see, you see that moving around there and the, and by most arguments um while the the, uh, the trailblazers excursion um which you know they they figured that it was going to take them less than a week and it took them 19 days to actually uh, make their way across um was only facilitated by the fact that that um, collier had sent out the equivalent of a caterpillar tractor to accompany them and every time that somebody got stuck um, helped pull them out but even so remember we have no cell phones we didn't even have telegraph lines going across at, the, at, at that point and the, uh, the newspapers had a, a an absolute field day saying oh these you know the um the trailblazers party is believed lost they they made up stories about how um you know making it it looked more perilous by saying that that um, almost half the group were women and the women were all in peril and they'd been been captured by hostile Indians and just, you know, or were being attacked and eaten by wild animals. Eventually the Miami Chamber of Commerce flew a plane over, saw them, um, landed and gave them supplies and, and actually had to go back because while they, um, uh, you know, were very happy to get food and water and all these sort Sorts of things. What they really needed was gasoline. They had not uh, planned on, on uh, running their engines for for over two weeks straight. Um, so once the trailblazers come across, it's established this can be done. It absolutely uh, is is doable. And when all the other uh, possibilities for financing this project dried up, Collier finally stepped in and said, fine, I will pay for it. Um, but that's how we got Collier County. Um, you know, by the time he even purchased the Everglades town site in 21, he owned over a million acres of, of Southwest Florida real estate. So he owned this, this very large uh, tract of land and um, he basically went to the legislature and sort of drew a circle around it and said, look, I'll pay for the road, but this area here, I want this to be Collier County. And they agreed to that. And, and um, you know, almost immediately after that, that, that was signed into to action, the construction on the road started. Um, you know, they went out and, they, and surveyed and the, the project began. So um, here you see one of the, the, the graders. Now, this was, uh, there were a lot of different terrains that, that they had, 
had to deal with. And some of them were just simply a, a question of, you know, knock down the hills, grade out the road. Um, you know, some of these had been uh, footpaths or wagon paths or, or you know, and certainly in the, in the dry season had been used. Um, you know, George Storter Jr., the, the, the Everglades Town founder, and Captain J.F. Jowden, um, the, the representative from Dade County, had walked the route uh, and, you know, to prove that, that it could be done and really done their own basic surveying as well. So um, the, the project gets underway, but it's a huge undertaking. Um, the reason that Everglades City was really, really established as the, the, the size of town that it was, when you, when you visit here, um, you know, the historic marker in front of the, the museum re refers to it as a company town, and it, it really was. Um, you know, Baron Collier owned the whole kit and caboodle. Pretty much everybody here worked for him, and it was a company town down to the, the, the fact that, that everybody got paid the script, and a whistle went off when the workday started. So, um, you know, when people say, well, if it was a company town, what, 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 was, what was the business of the company? Early on, um, the business of the company was building the road. He was simultaneously developing tourism. There's no question about that. Um, you know, he was, he was building a town that when you, when you look at the layout of the, of the city here, I mean, it has a central circle with boulevards leading up to it, like Washington, D.C. or Paris. I mean, it's, it's a very grand uh, concept with uh, neoclassical buildings like the original county courthouse that's now Everglades City Hall, uh, the bank building, you know, just the flowers everywhere, goldfish ponds in the middle of the boulevard. Um, and, you know, by 1929, there was a, a 45 room hotel. And I'm not, not talking about the Rod and Gun Club, which had 20 to 30 rooms on its own, but there, were, but there was a three story hotel a block away from where Museum of the Everglades, the commercial laundry was. So one of the, the main obstacles to building this road um, was creating fill. Um, when Henry Flagler was looking at, at taking the jump from uh, the, uh, the terminus in Miami out to Key West, they explored a lot of different routes. And he sent engineers and surveyors down through the Everglades uh, to Cape Sable, looking and seeing the, if that might be a better jumping off point, a, a, a straight shot straight down to, uh, to Key West rather than than over the chain of islands. And, you know, his, uh, uh, his surveyors basically, you know, got lost, had to be rescued, came back. And the, the great quote that's, that, that's always bandied about is, the, is um, Mr. Coe, his, his chief engineer saying, uh, there's not enough fill on the face of the earth to build a railroad across the Everglades. But 15 years later, somehow uh, Baron Collier is building a highway across it. And the way they did that was they had figured out that there was limestone cap rock about anywhere from five to 15 feet down beneath all the muck. And they drilled down into it and they planted dynamite and, and blasted the cap rock and made their own fill as they went across. Um, you know, this was a, a, a major undertaking, the, the, uh, uh, but the dynamite was a really, really Im important part of, the, of that effort. And the dynamite crews, the blasting crews, used both um, incredibly modern technology and, as you can see, um, very ancient technology. Uh, they, they moved the, the crates of dynamite with teams of oxen. There were, the, at, at any given time, there were, they had uh, uh, 40 oxen available, and, uh, but the average lifespan of these oxen working on this project was about three weeks. Um, now, we actually have, as one of our artifacts, facts here we have one of the original ox yokes that was used in one of these teams for all we know it might be one in in this this picture here um but you know men were also hauling the uh the the, uh, the dynamite once you got uh the, some makeshift rails put down and and uh 
you know, moving the dynamite. The, we, we have the, the actual number that there were 2,598,000 sticks of dynamite used in the, the creation of the trail. And that's, that's the equivalent of, of one full box car of dynamite every three weeks. Um, and, you know, comparatively speaking, another project of, of the, the, that was going on at the time, um, Mount Rushmore, it's 10 times the amount of, of dynamite that was ultimately used on, on Mount Rushmore. So, um, the uh, the as far as we can see that that the uh, provider of the dynamite was almost exclusively the Hercules Hercules Dynamite Company, and we can see that on the on the boxes here. Um, during this time, Florida had ranked 15th in the in the nation as as in the consumption of of, of dynamite, and it moved all the way up to number three during the during the construction of the trail. So. Um, we move on to the high tech, the drilling machine. So you've got the dynamite. Um, the, a drilling machine would would be rolled out over uh, makeshift rails. Sometimes the, the, uh, uh, the rails with it, that they were moving things on were wooden, but w for a machine this big and heavy, they needed steel rails. But you can see in this picture right here that they're not even um, hammered down. That uh, you know they're moving so slowly across there the, and, and, you know, through just deep muck and half the time underwater. Um, and this machine was, was uh, essential to this whole process. As I said, you know, it was, it was drilling a hole down into the, the, the cap rock for the insertion of dynamite. So these guys here, the blasting crew follows up behind. And as it says, those are not fishing poles. Those are dynamite poles and you can see the guys standing next to all their discarded Hercules powder boxes but they would put a stick of dynamite in the end of one of those poles and they would feed it down into the the hole and uh you know with wires trailing out of it and you use one of the old Wiley Coyote style plungers um I, I you try and use that reference with uh, a lot of the kids these days they have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about with the with the uh the Roadrunner cartoons, but um, uh, hopefully you, you folks know what I'm talking about. Um, so explosions in the Everglades, left and right, blasting the cap rock. So it leaves behind big boulders. And, you know, the, the, so what do they do now? They've gone through, they've, they've taken all the dynamite, they've blasted the cap rock. Now they have to... Uh, they, they have to build a roadbed out of it. So um, this is where technology that's invented, developed, and applied uh, comes together. And in a lot of ways, in the same way that, that you know, I, I, I guess I keep comparing to, to Flagler's project, uh, but this is very much the same in that it, that is that that it's like the NASA project of its day where they're actually developing technology that uh, that that can be used or they're taking technology that isn't quite good enough and they're improving and they're refining it um, in order to to uh, achieve the, their goals. You know, the, there were a lot of comparisons at the at the time of this project to the building of the Panama Canal. So uh, the dredges were, were definitely one of the, uh, the, the, the most important tools that, that um, were deployed in, the, in this project. And, and early on, it was two floating dredges uh, that they could get into the canals and they're trying to dig these canals, but, but um, and, and you can kind of get an idea of you know these these big floating dredges that are just kind of making their way, and and what they're doing is is they're they're scooping up with a steam shovel um, type scoop, uh, broken rock, big boulders, uh, digging them out and piling them on the side, and and the, they're basically fulfilling two goals at the, at the same time. They're creating a canal um, so they can control and divert the, the water flow, but they're also creating a roadbed with, with all the material that, that they're excavating there. And um, 
you can see there are a lot of, of, of different versions of it. Um, this one here uh, actually has sort of uh, the tractor type treads, but um, the um, most amazing of these machines was the walking dredge. And this is one of those technologies, as I said, uh, developed by um, the Bay City Dredge Company in, in uh, Bay City, Michigan. And they started with one of these and eventually uh, added three of them. And you can you picture these things. They're basically um, like an, a, a huge erector set of I-beams and, and you know, obviously pulleys and engines and things like that. But these things came down um, all in pieces on barges and, and were assembled in Everglades City and, the, and then deployed uh, at, the, at the, the actual work site. So you have a really good uh, image of it here. Um, these things actually walked. They had, um, they had six feet uh, the two in the the center were larger and longer, and the and the the ones at the corners were smaller and square. But it would basically lift up and move along, and the and it wasn't like it was you know moving with with any sort of uh, great speed. The 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 pace at which the uh, the walking dredges were uh, digging up the the and the the uh, canals and building roadbed. Uh, was about a mile a month. Um, one of these walking dredges was left intact and pretty much abandoned at the at the uh, the intersection of um, Highway 92 and, and 41 or San Marco Road. Um, and after Everglades National Park was established, it was moved into what is now Collier Seminole Park, and, and you know to really get a sense of of the immensity of the of this machinery, um, you know I certainly recommend a, a visit to the park. You, you know, the, as you can see, there's kind of a ramp, and you can you can walk up into the engine house and really gain an understanding of of uh, of you know the monumental task that that it was engaged in. We also have a scale model of it here that was built by a, um, a veteran of the Seabees, uh, Jerry Enders, and, and you know, to the scale of one inch equals one foot. So, um, you, and we also have a, an animation that we had commissioned that, so when you look at it and say, I don't get it, you can actually watch the animation and see the, the, exactly how the, the mechanism is moving from a couple different angles. Now, I mentioned J.F. Jowden uh, much, much earlier as somebody who walked across with, uh, with uh, George Storter Jr. Now, Jowden was the Dade County tax collector, and he had championed the building of the trail as early as 1915. Um, by 1918, he had um, been involved in the completion of 43 miles of, of moving toward the center of the state from uh, the Dade County line, which was, you know, really um, remarkable. And but part of it was the fact that he had a vested interest. He had bought, bought property in the in the center of what uh, you know we now consider the Everglades and Big Cypress Preserve, and, and wanted to create a, a community in very much the same way that that uh, uh, that Baron Collier did. And, and you know today we would we would probably frown on the on the uh, county tax collector being involved in a in a private uh, development project that he was. Um, championing the building of roads to reach, but at the time it was just kind of a little bit more business as usual. But um, and he was developing uh, this town site that he called Chevalier uh, at the end of, of if anybody knows Loop Road. Um, you look at this map here, and, and you can kind of get an idea. Um, the Chevalier Tract and the, and the, the uh, township that was eventually uh, known as Pinecrest. There are still a few buildings there. Um, anybody kn who knows about the crazy photographer guy that runs sort of a uh, an occasional speakeasy named Lucky Cole, 
um, he, you know, his place was was part of that or, original development there. And there are just a, a, a few places left. But um, Collier was not partnering with Jowden. Um, Collier was building the road and his original survey um, was in, intended its intended destination was uh, further north, uh, closer to Fort Lauderdale than to, than to Miami. And you can see the dip down and anybody who's made that, that drive knows about that bend. Well, that bend wasn't originally intended and it was one of those things where they just said, look, the road there is already built, let's just connect with it. And that's why Loop Road actually exists is because the the uh, the 76 miles that, that, that that Collier um, had built was was connected to the effort that that uh, J.F. Jowden was was involved in, and the, and the uh, the curvy part on the, the below the loop where where you can see just where it it, it goes back up from um, where it says Pinecrest uh, is all gravel road at this point. But it you know it's a 26 mile uh, detour that or scenic detour that that allows a lot of people still enjoy taking and kind of like the, the opportunity to drive through the Everglades uh, with, you know, and, and see a little bit of the, the wildlife with it with without going all the way down to the National Park. Um, construction on the trail was completed uh, April 25th, 1928 uh, to much fanfare. Uh, there was a grand celebration, the trail dedication, and what was the very first Collier County Fair uh, took place the day after the completion in, on April 26, 1928. Now Collier had, um, as, as I said, once the, the, the state legislature agreed to rename the, the, this area Collier County, um, he had, you know, it, it was official. And I wanna say May 6th was, was the, the official date for the establishment of the, of the county in 23. So we are coming up on our uh, centennial. And as you can see, the, the town of, of Everglades uh, decorated to the gills um, on the far right. There's that hotel that I was talking about. Um, you can't really see um, the, the museum um, going down there, but it's it's between the uh, the the garage and the uh, the jailhouse on the on the, the right hand side. But uh, but big event, um, Collier County Fair, big parades, um, lots of of uh, crazy stuff going on. You had um, parade floats, people dressed as swamp fairies, um, the um, representatives from the from the Seminole tribe in all different parts of the state were invited to participate. And um, another picture of the town decorated to the gills and um, a, the swamp ferry float. Um, it talks about the motorcade. Um, there was just a, an endless, endless motorcade of Model Ts, Model As, every car that, that, that anybody could drive coming down to, to Everglades and then um, driving the road, over 200 cars came to participate. Um, and, but it was, a, it was a big deal. This is a, the, the um, front page of, of um, one of the local newspapers at the time talking about all the different uh, uh, South Florida leaders that, that had attended the, um, uh, the celebration. And this celebration of the completion of the trail is an annual tradition here. Um, and unfortunately, it's one that, that we had to forego last year. And we're kind of looking at what we're going to end up being able to do at this point. Um, it's it's a bit tenuous. Um, events to be announced, as they say. <laughs> but um, you know, if you want to stay tuned on uh, on CollierMuseums.com and see what we're going to be able to do in the past, um, we we've, we've had you know a, um, a a reading of of Baron Collier's dedication speech, which I'm going to 
get to in in just a moment. Um, we, you know, it's it's also the anniversary of when the museum opened, so we always celebrate the museum's birthday and and serve birthday cake. We usually have live music, uh, classic car parade, things like that. But this is a photo of. Um, Baron Collier III standing on the steps of, of City Hall and reading the speech that, that uh, his father gave. And I would like to share that with you. It's, um, the, it's relatively brief, and, but I think that it's very poignant. And, and he gave this speech on the, the 26th of April, 1928. It says, today the eyes of the world are focused on Florida and the world sees the completion of the greatest highway that this splendid peninsula has ever possessed. Not only its value to the millions of visitors who will use it, but to the entire population of Southeast Florida. A wholesome feeling of gratitude predominates in the minds of those who know, and these have a feeling of admiration and thankfulness for the governor of this great commonwealth, the chairman of the, the state road department, and our corps of masterful engineers. They performed what first seemed a nebulous dream, but which is now a vital accomplishment, link, linking the Atlantic to, to the Gulf and stretching a belt of granite highway for the 273 miles between the wonder city of Miami and the busy metropolis of Tampa. These men, I know, gladly join me here and now in paying homage to that vast army of workers who, with pick, shovel, and dynamite, literally blasted this magnificent road through to completion. From every bend of their weary backs, from every heave of their mighty shoulders, sprang some new segment of this beautiful trail. That which we look upon today is but a great mosaic made up of these segments. To those workers, and their number was legion, we pay sincere tribute. And to that tireless, efficient, persevering chief engineer, D. Grand Copeland, under whose personal direction these men labored, all Florida owes a lasting debt of gratitude. The Tamiami Trail is finished. The impossible has been accomplished. It couldn't be done, but Florida did it. And I think that that's a, a really inspiring statement and really it's a, it's a, a, a great note to end on. Um, you know, there's, there's much more to the story, much more to see, much more to learn, but I do encourage everybody to come visit us uh, the, at Museum of the Everglades and, and take even more of it in, see some of the artifacts associated with it, um, watch the animation of how the dredge moved and, and you know, learn a bit more about the the, uh, the 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 contributions that were made and the, and the role that Everglades City has played as the the, the birthplace of Collier County. Um, and for those who say, "Oh, well, we've been to the museum," it's changed a lot in the last few years. And we also have a, a rotating gallery that where we change every three months. And we're currently featuring an exhibit called Everglades Oasis: Plumbing the Depths of Deep Lake's History. And, and for those who don't know what Deep Lake is, it's about 50, an area about 15 miles north of, of uh, Everglades. And it was the very first piece of property that Baron Collier purchased in what would eventually grow to become Collier County. Uh, there was a grapefruit grove there, um, and there was a narrow gauge railroad connecting that grove to Everglades City to move the picked fruit. Um, but that would eventually grow to become uh, an, a spur of the Atlantic Coastline Railway really connecting Collier County with the rest of the world. So again, visit us soon and thank you for, uh, thank you for participating. I'll, I'll take any questions that anybody might have. During that entire construction, um, were there um, many changes in, in the crews that were there? Were there many deaths? Were there, you know, what were the hardships, I guess? Um, okay, so um, these are, th this is a, a, a couple different jokes. Okay. And, one, and one is that, that um, when people, there's a, there's a Collier quote where he, he says, I've got um, uh, one crew on duty, one crew on their way out, and one crew coming in. That it that, that it was a, just a continuous rotation of 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 crews, and, and from in and out, he meant from Tampa. Um, that's where the 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 bulk of the workforce was coming from, rather than from the, from the East Coast. But as far as um, the um, they're very specific about how not a single life was lost. 
but um, a personal anecdote for the 90th anniversary celebration, we had two Collier grandsons visiting the museum. Um, we had Barry the third, who you saw giving the speech, and his cousin Terry, and, the, and um, yeah, they, you know, and they share uh, a grandfather. And, you know, they're, they're going through the museum they'd never been through before. And Terry looks over at Barry and he says, can you believe that? Not a single life was lost in this whole process. And Barry looks over at his cousin and he says, you do remember that granddad was in the advertising business, don't you? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, what, whatever the case was, it's very unlikely that not a single life was lost because, I mean, back then, you know, you got a bad cut and, and you know, you lose a limb to gangrene or, or, you know, septic poisoning, those sorts of things. It just wasn't that uncommon, particularly in working, um, you know, labor like this with heavy machinery that, that, and, and that much dynamite that, that there's going to be a catastrophe somewhere. But the, the, the advertising tycoon spin on it was not a single life lost. Anybody else? Any other questions? It's it, it's a tough topic to to um, to address because it really, in its own right, you know, it's it's five different talks all in one. I mean, you could sit and you could get you could give an entire talk just about the walking dredge or uh, about the work crews and and you know. The, um, I, I joke about, the, well, I tell Collier's joke about one coming in, one on its way out, and one, one at work, but um, they had, they, they did everything that they could to make uh, these fellas relatively comfortable. They even had trucks coming out um, and dispensing ice water. Um, you know, there were, there were permanent structures that gave shelter all the, all the way along. There was, you know, the, the um, medical care, um, you know, the, the, they, they fed them. So it wasn't, um, you know, it, it, it wasn't chain gang labor. It, it was certainly difficult. There's no question. Um, it, was a, it was a lot of hard work, but, um, you know, they, they did what they could to, to ease the strain. I, uh, um, I have a question here in the chat, uh, Thomas. It says, what kind of planning where canals went or connected? Um, you mean as far as the, as ecological planning or or those sorts of things? I don't think that there there was much, if any, concern. I think that we have to realize, and I, and I should probably address this as well. Um, there's a part. Part of this, the, the museum that really it celebrates the Tamiami Trail as this miracle of modern engineering, and it really is. But there's a whole other side to it, and that is that that it's it's the longest dike anywhere outside the Netherlands. You know that, that um, we understood the Everglades as a big mud puddle at that time. You know, and it, it, it really doesn't serve us well to moralize on that. So, um, it's tragic, some of the ecological effects that, that it's had. We didn't understand it as an 80 mile wide, slow moving river that we were stopping the flow of and, and not just a slow moving river, but a filtration system that was essential to the, the aquifer and the, and the, the, the drinking water and the, just the, 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 um, you know the the flora and fauna of not just South Florida, but but well beyond there. So I think that there that you know the planning was from a standpoint of well, there's water here, let's divert it over there. Um, you know, it really was just the, uh, a question of let's build a road this way, but there wasn't a whole lot of eco planning, and I and I think that you can see that in. in you know, even today when you drive across and, and the culverts where water passes under are very, very few and far between. But now with, with, with some of the, the efforts to raise the road that, um, you know, the last few times that I've driven 41 to Miami and, you know, th that now we've got this elevated causeway and the, and the, the sheet flow is really, really being restored. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a wonderful uh, movement um, to, you know, to 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 restore the ecological integrity of the of the area, put it back where it should have been. And I guess this is also that moment when I should acknowledge um, the fact that this project 
um, really did disenfranchise our, our, um, our indigenous people. You know, there wasn't a lot of consideration given to the fact that there were people living living here. And we just said, oh, by the way, we're, we're building a road through here. And it wasn't just a question of like, if, if you, you know, put your driveway across your neighbor's lawn, it, it had much uh, broader, far reaching effects on the on the Seminole people, because this was a tribe that that was predating the Tamiami Trail was for the most part migratory, that they would move around different parts of this area at different points in the season using different camps that they had established. And this really, really um, just made that next to impossible. Uh, you know, it wasn't just a question of, of well, when your canoe gets to the, the, the big road, you just portage your canoe over to the other side, because sometimes of year that meant that there wasn't any water on the other side of, the, of that, that big road. And, you know, the, the entire culture and commerce of the, of the Seminole people at that time, you know, it had a lot to do with interacting with the trading posts. Um, and, you know, you, you look at, at where the traditional homes are, on, you know, around Lake Okeechobee and, the, and that area and, and making your way down by canoe to, you know, the, the trading post with the Stranahan's and the, in Fort Lauderdale and the Brickles or, or even, you know, the Smallwood store in, in Chukaluski, it just wasn't possible anymore. So it really, it, it wasn't just a, a, a taking of land. It was a, um, you know, an, an eclipsing of the of the culture, and I think that that Collier really meant well when when you know his response was to say, "Well, we're going to have a road. Well, why don't you set up um, you know tourist camps at the side of the road, and you can um, you know sell beads and you know do patchwork and things like that." And you know, it the even I I let the the Seminole tribe speak for themselves. Um, and the, when I've, I've read, and there's actually even a, an exhibit at the Atatiki Museum, which I've, I've certainly um, encourage anybody who's interested in learning more about the, the Seminole tribe and culture to, uh, to visit. There's a sign that talks about the tourist camps and, where, and that the, there are people in the tribe that find it a very, very uh, degrading, insulting thing that, 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 that they were forced into. There are other people who remember it as the best times in their lives, that, who really enjoyed it and who grew up um, you know, selling dolls and, and wrestling alligators and things like that and, and had a lot of fun with it. So, um, but, you know, it, it is something that we do necessarily need to acknowledge when, when we discuss the, uh, the building of the Tamiami Trail. Okay, so I have a couple more comments. Um, <clears throat> one says, I guess, there was no geographical usage planning because they didn't know about ecology then which you just virtually talked about. And someone else says, excellent, thank you. Come back and tell us more. And then there's a question, um, says, was there a plan for fishermen housing? Was there a plan in their thinking about moving goods and protection from savages, which I guess also means wild animals? Um. <sighs> You know, it, it the road definitely opened up a whole new um, realm of of commerce, of you know being able to trade back and forth with with, with both coasts, and um, you know an, another one of those talks that could be you know uh, it's a, a talk in itself is the Southwest Mountain Patrol, um, and that is that. that um, Collier thought of everything except he didn't because they opened the trail and suddenly they were like, oh, we don't have any gas stations. And so they, they kind of retrofitted the area with, with, um, with six aid stations and they're 20 miles apart. And he staffed them with a, the, the, uh, preferably with a, a, a husband and wife team and the wife would be, uh, pump gas and, and act as a short order cook while her husband rode a motorcycle uh, 10 miles either direction so that they overlapped and they had coverage 
coverage of the entire trail with what was Collier's private police force, but the Florida Highway Patrol, even if you look at their website today, they acknowledge um, the, the uh, Southwest Mounted Patrol as the, the, the pr their predecessor. It's where it's, it started, and they were eventually deputized, so they are official uh, officially recognized as uh, the, the very first Florida Highway Patrolman. But, um, and you know, Collier with his the flair for, for the dramatic and advertising, he had purchased um, a, um, a, a supply of red tunics from, uh, that, that had been discarded from a, a film about the, the uh, Canadian Mounties. And he fitted all his guys on motorcycles with these red tunics um, so that they were easily recognizable. But um, so the the, uh, the uniforms were, were the same as, as uh, Royal Canadian Mounted Police on these motorcycles. And yep. a anybody that remembers, you know, the, the, the one of the last stations that was standing was Monroe Station, which tragically got burned in, in um, an arson event um, a, a few years back. But but there is still one of those aid stations standing at, at at what is uh, known as, as Royal Palm Hammock. And that's at that, that gas station at the corner of um, 92 or San Marco Road and 41. Uh, you can actually see the, the, uh, the original structure is still part of that, that, that gas station there. Okay, so um, one person wants to know what is the best book on this subject? And if there isn't one, have you written one? And if you haven't, you should. <laughs> um, they're the best book on the subject, which is, it's very dense reading. Even as a historian, it's one of those books where I'm like, oh, there's so much information here. Um, it's called Roads Through the Everglades by Bruce, Bruce Epperson. And this guy researched absolutely everything. And, you know, all the way, if there was a, a little ditch that that where there used to be a road he walked through it and he talked about working together with the park service and he said you know this is all poison ivy so they'd wrap him up in a tyvek suit um so he could go out and take his his pictures um but yeah it's really really comprehensive and it and, and um he it's got three sections and one of them is uh the tamiami trail um the the ingram highway um the, the out of uh, off Miami is one of them, and I can't remember what the third is, but there's a, a very uh, good, uh, long and, and in depth section on the Tamiami Trail in that one. Great. Now, um, this, this person that asked about the canals before, well, I'm just going to read what he has here and I'll see if I can try to understand what he's asking. He says, Not the road. Still wondering about canal placement, why they are haphazard for boating. So I think what his question is, is that canal along the roadway, that was actually created by the blowing up of the limestone rock, right? Yeah, yep. We didn't really plan to put a canal there. It's just that that's what happened when they blew up the rock. Is that correct, I guess? Yes. And, and it, you know, and certainly when you get closer to Miami, you start to see more of the, of the, these, there are not only access roads, but there appear to be access canals that, that are dug in at, at, at different spots. And those are all after the fact. Um, and, you know, and, and as far as the, the other stuff, um, that has to do with the, the Army Corps of Engineers, you'd have to ask them because <laughs> most historians will look and say, there is no rhyme or reason to this. But um, the historians and, um, the, and uh, you know, biologists and, and uh, the eco scientists uh, look at it and say, what on earth were they thinking? So. Yeah, well, that sort of answer, he has another question about canal placement. I think you've sort of answered that. Uh, but he did ask about, were they worried about, um, wild animals or the Indians? Did they have the people there to protect them? Right? The, in, the Indians were actually working with and for them. Um, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the Indians had been walking back and forth across this area, um, you know, forever. And they were the ones that, that, that really, you know, showed the footpaths that, that were there and they led the surveying teams. Um, you know, they, they were employed um, in, in a lot of instances, 
um, you know, for for the surveying and and you know that the while the while the Seminole tribe never signed a, a, a treaty, um, you know, there's been you know what would be considered relative peace since uh, the, the the end of of the Seminole Wars in in 1858. So I don't think that anybody was necessarily really concerned that, that, that there was going to be an attack. As far as uh, the, uh, uh, you know, wild animals, um, you know, you're talking about a bunch of guys with dynamite and, and um, you know, wild animals have a tendency to get as far away from, you know, loud um, noises and explosions and things like that as they possibly can. So I'm not saying that there weren't, you know, um, water moccasins as they're, they're waiting through and, and whatnot, but but for the most part, um, you know, I don't think that that it was a, a major concern or a, you know a source of any sort of trauma. Well, thank you, everybody. I I appreciate being invited and, and having the opportunity to share a little bit and and come visit us out here. Um, you know, we're open Tuesday through Saturday, nine to four. <laughs>